Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast. I'm your host, Mike Conrad. For those of you who are keeping track, this is episode number 112. Let's face it, our industry survives on electricity. There would be no circuit assemblies, no electronics without electricity. Electricity is the fuel that moves our industry, allows innovation, evolution, and even revolution within the electronics world. We are all aware of the potential dangers of electricity. Electricity in the wrong place at the wrong time can be deadly. Uninvited electrical current on an electrical component or a circuit assembly or even a device can render severe and potentially expensive damage. This uninvited electricity most commonly finds its way through electrostatic discharge, or ESD. Fortunately, our industry is generally well aware of the potential dangers of electrostatic discharge and, over the years, has implemented policies, procedures, and products to mitigate electrostatic discharge and the damage caused by it. My guest today is Christopher Almeres. Christopher began his career in process engineering for a small electronics manufacturer in the late 1990s. There he became responsible for ESD, or electrostatic discharge compliance verification. His next career move took him to a high volume manufacturer where he added ESD coordinator to his title. Eventually, he made the jump into military and aerospace side of electronics manufacturing in 2010, where, at Raytheon, works in process capital installations, continuous improvement, and ESD mitigation. In 2009, Christopher completed his ESD certified program manager from the ESDA, Electrostatic Discharge Association. He serves as a member on several ESD Association standards committees, including S20.20, TR53, Process Assessment, High Reliability, Electrostatic Attraction, among others. In 2022, he became the Working Group Chair for Soldering and Desoldering Hand Tools. Christopher was elected to the ESD Association's Board of Directors and continues to be active with the ESD Symposium each year. Christopher recently founded Lone Star Electrostatic Solutions, a business which provides its customers with full-service solutions for their ESD needs. Christopher earned his Bachelor's of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University and his Master's of Industrial Engineering at Oklahoma State University. So without any further ado, let's welcome Chris. Hey, Chris. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. I have to say, you win the award for best hat in your um, in your headshot. That's that's a cool uh, hat. Win in Texas, you have to do as Texans do, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, no one could have said that better. I'm a big fan of the show Yellowstone, which of course is not near Texas. It's 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 very north of you. But uh, I've I've fallen in love with uh, you know quote unquote cowboy hats, or as you would call them, hats, uh, and uh, that's a pretty cool one. Uh, welcome. Actually, we call them required attire. Required attire, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yes, I, I agree. We, uh, my wife turned sixty earlier this year, and we went to Nashville as one does, right? And terrorized Broadway, and and I brought an old Stetson that I had from years ago, and I had to kind of reshape it because it didn't fare well in my closet, buried between, you know, under all my baseball caps, but. Uh, I got it reshaped, and that was fun. I, I pretended I was, you know, a southerner for a few days, and it, uh, I don't think I that. really saw the the heart of the South, you know, in in Nashville necessarily. I saw the tourist version of it, but it, it was a whole lot of fun. Um, and I do enjoy going to Texas. It's a it's a huge state. But your highways are in better shape than mine are. I'm in California, and one thing I noticed, regardless of where you were in Texas, at least by comparison, your highways were clean and uh, they appeared to be well-maintained and, and all of that. I guess that's one advantage of not living in, in, in an environment where it snows and ices up and cracks the road every year and things like that. Uh, we, have our, we have our share of uh, not so good roads too, but um, you know, that's what four-wheel drive trucks are for, right? There you go. Yeah. Hats and trucks. There you go. 
Well, again, thanks for being my guest today. I've long wanted to talk about um, ESD, electrostatic discharge. Uh, but before we, we get into that, of all of the specialties that one could choose or fall into within our industry, you know, I've talked to reflow experts and profile experts and soldering material experts and failure analysis experts. What uh, drew you to or what circumstances uh, pulled you into uh, the whole world of electrostatic discharge? Uh, honestly, to begin with, I was uh, voluntold into it uh, with, um, you know, doing the compliance verification checks uh, at my very first stop in the industry. And so it was during that time, you know, doing that for a few years where I kind of got an idea of um, what, you know, what control items, you know, go on and or that you need in a typical electronics manufacturer. And then from there, uh, when I made my second stop in the industry working uh, automotive electronics, we had an issue that um, uh, some component that kept falling out. And I happened to mention about the potential for it being an ESD event and with the way that line was set up and stuff. And um, turned out I was correct about that. And so the company was like, okay, well, we don't know much about ESD, so go get training um, on it because you appear to know more than others. And so, you know, that uh, they tell you to go get training. Sure. Why not? Sure. They were paying for it. And, uh, you know, it as you get further into it, you realize uh, how much uh, there is to it. It's not just it's not just black and white. There's there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of. Uh, if, if you're someone who likes challenges, uh, puzzles, whatever, that's basically kind of what you're dealing with when you're trying to figure out any ESD issues. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge. And so I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm sure it's been quite a ride. That's how this industry is. You kind of get sucked into it. And, you know, I didn't, when I was a young teenager, I didn't dream of being in this industry. I didn't even know of this industry. I just thought electronics showed up one day, brought by a stork or something. You know, you don't, you just don't know what you don't know. And, um, and here we are, you know, uh, in my case, 37 years later, I'm still in this industry. I've said this on the show before, but this is a, um, a life sentence in this industry. Uh, when you go to trade shows, you see the same people. They're wearing different uh, badges and standing in different booths. But, you know, you, people seem to leave the industry in either a box or by winning the lottery and buying an island somewhere. You know, they, they don't generally leave. If they do, it's for a short time, and then they're back again. You know, it's okay. Groundhog Day in many, many yes. respects. Yeah, I'm yes. sure that's been your, your journey too. So for the sake of my audience, the majority of my audience is in this industry you know, and electronic assembly and EMS world and all that. Not all are. So let's just not assume anything and – kind of begin with a beginner's mindset. Tell me um, what electrostatic discharge is and the damage it can impose, you know, from a 30,000 foot level. Give me a broad description of uh, what ESD is and, and what it is we're trying to mitigate. All right, so uh, ESD is just basically, you know, charge builds up onto an object, right? And it's just the transfer of that charge from one object to another. It's, you know, just your, your basic science, the things you uh, hopefully were learning in, you know, middle school science for those our age. I think uh, kids these days probably learn it in first grade. But uh, basically, uh, when that charge builds up on an object during our processing of electronics, if it um, discharges or jumps to a component or a assembly uh, product, uh, it can it can do you know two types of damage. Uh, basically, latent damage, which is damage you see a little bit later, usually shows up during the functionality at some time, or you know catastrophic damage, which uh, makes the the part not work basically at all beginning and it's you know due to the sensitivity levels of of these components or assemblies um which you know are as we've gone gone the, over the last 20 25 years especially you know these these assemblies keep getting smaller 
and more powerful, especially like cell phone industry and that kind of stuff. And so it's just basically a, um, just basically a, the movement of uh, electrons from one object to another is, is really what ESD is just in our case, it can be uh, very dangerous. Yeah. You mentioned two types of problems, latent damage and catastrophic damage. I would assume latent damage is more insidious. It's a worse problem only because you don't know you have a problem. Maybe you plug something in, you're not wearing your wrist strap, or you touch something without your wrist strap, and you go, oh, shoot, yeah. or something equivalent. And you test it, and you go, oh, phew, it's working. But the right. damage may already have been done, right? It may have weakened something in the system or created a situation where something maybe later won't calibrate properly, uh, as opposed to poof. You know, when you get the poof, the catastrophic damage, you know you're in trouble, but you can right. fix it before it goes out or replace it before it ships out. Uh, latent damage is uh, is a time bomb in many ways, right? Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes sometimes you see your latent damage at test and don't realize it. It can be as simple as you know resistor resistance value has shifted just a little bit, uh, and, and but it still falls within the you know the tolerance of of what your test may be measuring and and stuff like that. So you know, and it just drifts out over time. Uh, especially the the more the uh, assembly is ran in in whatever its uh, end use is, and and that can be you know you know frustrating for customers and stuff that hey seemed to work when I first got it and then now you know especially you know in the military aerospace field you know it's expected to work at all times, and you get something you know year and a half two years down the road and all of a sudden it's it's having just these little issues and not functioning fully and. Uh, you know, that, that becomes a huge problem for our customers and can become a black eye for any of us in the industry that's uh, producing that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. It's a, uh, it could be an instant RMA, uh, which is costly, or it could, and or it could be damage to the reputation. Unfortunately, damage right. to the reputation is hard to put a price tag on, right? Because you, you don't know. Right. Uh, you're, you're the last to find out. As the old adage goes, like a product, tell one person, hate a product, tell a hundred people, right? So word gets out. Yeah. With social media, that uh, turns into thousands and thousands of people very quickly. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, so you're on the board of directors, as I mentioned in the intro, you're on the board of directors of the ESDA. I assume that stands for Electrostatic Discharge Association, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Well, it didn't take too much, too many brains to figure that one out. Um, tell me more about the ESDA. Um, what are its services? What what uh, benefits does it provide its members? What, what what's it all about? So basically, the ESDA, uh, you know, they they provide actually uh, multiple services. Uh, they are the let's call them best way that I can think of describing as the caretaker of of the standards for electrostatic discharge, the S2020 standard, which is basically the Bible on how to set up your factory to protect uh, from, you know, ESD events happening at least to a certain level. Um, also TR53 standard, which is the test methods for compliance verification of your control items, your ionizers, uh, flooring, you know, those kind of things, uh, along with a lot of other documentation. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, some of the ones I'm involved in, the uh, TR-17, which is on process assessment. The This year released the TR-19, which is on high reliability. It's ec extra steps you can take to protect, you know, um, you can call it more valuable product if, if you want. Um, and then, you know, beyond the standards and documentation, the SD provides training. Uh, they'll, they provide training to TR-53 for to certify technicians to be able to do your compliance verification. Um, they they provide other informative things. They have tech talks online and stuff to discussing uh, like the SD, the technology roadmap and, and different things like that. Um, and then, of course, every year they, they, they put on different workshops and the ST symposium. And the ST Symposium is uh, really a, a good, it's a, it's, a, it's a great conference to, to be at 
to learn a lot because there's so many people that uh, attend that have been in ESD for a long time and, and it's valuable to be able to pick their brains, but they do wonderful workshops on, on at the symposium on different things from, you know, we did one this year on process assessment where we actually had a piece of equipment, you know, as just a little automated handler, actually two of them where, where we did a demonstration on, you know, what are the things you would check to try and, you know, make sure that this wasn't, you know, uh, creating any kind of danger um, to your, your, you know, electronics or components and that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of um, papers are presented and also, you know, just other, uh, you know, discussion topics, uh, you know, on, on just some of the latest things going on with ESD stuff. And there's also a designed side to it that's uh, more catered towards those who are doing the design of components and, and circuits. So you do yeah, a lot of things. What I find interesting, two things. Um, it's a little bit ironic that the Bible, the ESD Bible, you refer to that as 2020. Um, and of course, we've learned a lot about ESD through 2020 hindsight, right? So it's, it's uh, kind of ironic that uh, it, it, particularly in the case of latent damage, as we discussed earlier, uh, that's a 2020 thing. You know, we don't realize it at the time. We realize it when we look back, maybe the, the mistakes we made. Mm -hmm. Also, what, what I find interesting is that there are still standards being um, revised and, and designed for ESD. It, it, it's, from my standpoint, I don't know much about ESD, except, you know, wear your wrist straps, your heel straps, all that stuff, right? Um, always be grounded. Don't be floating. And, and um, yet there's so much more to it. And the fact that there are revisions to standards and new standards and things like that tells me, and that there are conferences that people attend that have been aware of ESD for generations, tells me that uh, A, there's conferences so that when new people come into the industry, they can get up to speed. And B, it's a little bit of a moving target that uh, perhaps miniaturization, as you mentioned earlier, and other, other uh, factors that are part of the evolutionary process of electronics are changing the ESD requirements. Uh, they, they seem to be getting tighter uh, and, and not staying, pardon the pun, but it's not static. You know, the, the um, standards are not static. They seem to be evolving. Is that due to obviously things like miniaturization, as you mentioned, but other factors as well? Well, miniaturization is, is really the key. Um, you know, when the S2020 was first established, you know, it, it set the, that, hey, this is, this is telling you how to set up your factory to be able to handle any components that have sensitivities down to 100 volts human body model, you know, and then, X, uh, you know, 250 volts charge device model. And while that works for, and for the longest time worked for well over 95% of what anyone would, would be handling um, in our industry, miniaturization is creating uh, more sensitive components, you know, down to 50, you know, 25 volts human body model that, you know, can, you know, can be damaged by that and, and lower CDMs and stuff. And so because of that, we're always having to, you know, what are, what are test methods to be able to um, keep your controls uh, able to meet if you have that kind of susceptibility, right? And then, you know, there's just like any other industry, there's improvements that are made, especially on the, um, on, you know, your test and your measurement equipment, you know, for, you know, the, the standard ionizer tests is, you know, you have your decay time, you know, and also a, a, a balance check. Well, there's, there's uh, companies out there that are working on making that, you know, easier to do uh, a little more, um, you know, well, besides easy, just, you know, less time consuming than necessarily the old charge plate method. Um, and stuff. And so because of that there, you got to start working that stuff in once it becomes, you know, kind of set in stone that, Hey, this, this does give us information, uh, that, that we need and is consistent. 
and stuff. And then with the like the process assessment, high reliability, uh, those are ones that are really kind of filling some voids that we've had uh, from documentation um, over the over the years. It's doing a process assessment to hey, this is what can my process handle from a sensitivity component sensitivity standpoint, right? There was not much information out there. And what there was, was usually in, in, in different technical papers or in different areas and, and did not have a lot of the background information possibly needed on, you know, what to go and, and do what, you know, the important parts of the measurements, what things to, to look for. And, and the document still doesn't have all that. There's still other holes kind of we need to fill, but uh, a lot of it here recently over the last five years has just been trying to find those gaps in the information that, that we're providing to the um, industry and trying to fill those with, you know, proven methods and, and useful information. Because really, I mean, we're all in this together. Yeah, that's right. Um, in, in my world, I, I'm in the cleaning world in, you know, my day job. And miniaturization is our best friend because – for the same reasons, as things get closer together, the amount of, of residue that an assembly can tolerate is far lower than it would be when we were all in the through-hole days. And I would imagine for the exact same reasons, um, ESD is now more critical on miniaturized components because it, it doesn't have to go far between one component and another, and, uh, and they're more sensitive. They're, they're, they're densely packaged and they're more sensitive components to ESD and contamination and, and probably other things as well. Um, a couple of real quick anecdotes. Uh, I, I think when you and I had a conversation a week or so ago, I, I probably mentioned this to you, but for the sake of my audience, I, I got into this industry in 1985. I was 25 years old and I had never seen an electronic assembly environment before. I came from a completely different industry. So I was, I was very green. And the, uh, I, I was on the shop floor and they had all of us strap up. You know, this is, I don't know when ESD was first put on the map as a, as a major concern, but this was probably the earlier days of ESD. And it was the most archaic system I'd ever seen. And fortunately, it was the only shop I've seen that did this. Um, but I thought, Everyone does this. There's got to be a better way. They had a series of tight wire cables hanging from the ceiling, um, almost like these electric streetcars that you know you would see, like in, in San Francisco and a few other cities. Uh, and attached to the cable was a solid metal ring, pretty heavy ring. And hanging from the ring was a cord, which attached to a wrist strap. So the um, these cables were every so many feet, like down aisles, and they would go X, Y. So they would be north, south, east, west cables. And people would walk from one section of the factory floor to another, dragging the cable attached to the ring, scraping along the, the tight cable, and like they were connected like a streetcar. And if they had to change directions, like go north for three aisles and then make a left and go, uh, you know, west for three aisles, they would have to grab another cable from another, um, uh, uh, another um, wrist strap connection from another cable connected to a ring on the other wire and then start traveling that way. And as you can just imagine the noise all this made as people were walking up and down doing their thing, dragging these hard metal loops across a, a, a tight metal cable. And if you were to pass somebody, you know, if you're, you're going north, someone's coming south, you had to, once you got face to face, you had to swap wristbands so that you can keep walking. It was the most archaic thing I'd ever seen. And I'm like, this electronics industry is not that sophisticated, you know, but I guess that was a, a quote unquote poor man's ESD control. Uh, they didn't have any ESD flooring back then. And the other funny anecdote was also in my early years, I, I went into a facility that had ESD floors and they, they handed out um, heel straps, you know, to put on. And then they had a little tester before they let you in the room. You had to stand on this tester and it would give you a green or a red or a yellow, whatever it was. 
And, you know, I, I passed it, but someone I was with kept failing. And our escort was like, did you attach the heel strap properly? He goes, yeah, shoved it in my shoe. He goes, well, I don't understand why. You, let me see it. And it turned out he took the whole wrist strap and shoved it in a shoe. The whole thing. The, the, the heel, the, the everything. And, and shoved the whole thing in a shoe. And couldn't figure out why he wasn't passing. It was like, might as well have just put it in your pocket, right? It, it, it was just as effective. But, um, you know, that's a, an example of following, somewhat following directions, but not understanding the spirit of why we're doing that. You know, not understanding the concept of grounding, not understanding how electrons flow. Um, they just did what they thought they were told to do and thought everything would miraculously be okay. And of course, he never got past the door, you know, until he got that, that fixed. But uh, my well, early introduction. That, uh, we, uh, we, we still see some of that stuff today. I mean, as, as much training as, as a lot of places go through, you still, I live it on a daily basis where, <laughs> where I, I see uh, straps put on wrong or just things uh, you, you think your procedure and your training is clear. And uh, to some people it, it isn't. And so you get to go back and, and uh, make another slide or, or whatever to, <laughs> to try and convey what really needs to be done. Training so. just got 15 minutes longer now. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. And we're going to get into that a little bit. That's my favorite topic on the show is talking about things that fail, that go wrong. But uh, we'll get into that in, in a few minutes. For, for many people um, that have a basic knowledge of ESD mitigation, um, that is a wrist strap, maybe a heel strap. Um, you know, they... They don't touch things unless they're grounded. Um, what other, in addition to flooring and, and human grounding, what are some of the other ESD uh, mitigation techniques or devices or procedures that uh, protect our, the, the, the products we make and the products we use? So I, I mentioned uh, ionizers briefly earlier. Uh, ionizers is you know, very commonly used uh, to, you know, remove charges off of product or, or other items. Uh, so basically, you know, there's, there's kind of multiple ways to, to go about it, but you're, you're either wanting to remove charge from everything that could come in contact with or uh, come in close proximity with your sensitive devices or use materials that will not um, charge up and will not discharge. So there's a couple ways you can, you can go about it. You've got your control items, your ionizers, your grounding and stuff like that. But, you know, key item is the, you know, that sometimes gets overlooked is, you know, the materials you use throughout your process, right? If you use uh, materials that won't charge up any of your devices or won't hold the charge, uh, you know, in places of contact, or as we like to also call, um, you know, put in soft landings, as, as I like to call them, where, you know, when I'm working on a circuit card or whatever, your, you know, your typical workstation with your ESD math that's grounded, um, that usually provides a soft landing because there's some resistance to that ground. Usually, you know, the mat is it, 10 to the sixth or, or 10 to the seventh. That way, if there is any charge on your product, it's going to slowly drain out and not be a very fast drain out, which, you know, can cause damage. Um, you know, I've, several people have seen, you know, besides myself, I've ran into it before is, is where people are like, well, you know, I have a metal table and I grounded it and they just did a straight ground wire, no resistance to it. And then found out that, hey, placing a board on it that had a little bit of charge to it, you know, created, created an event because it, it drew all the charge out of that board so quickly because there was no resistance going to ground. So, um, we were guilty yeah, of that so, years ago and years and years and years ago, we, uh, yeah. we came up with a new product that had, uh, that had the need to be ESD safe. Um, products were put on top of this workspace and, uh, we decided to, um, put a stainless steel worktop on it. I figured, wow, that, you know, 
very few things conduct electricity better than metal, you know, we'll put a metal top on it. And we thought, uh, and then, a, you know, a, a place to plug in, no resistor. I, we didn't have the concept of soft landing. We just kind of like the guy that stuck the um, heel strap in his shoe, the whole thing in his shoe. We just thought, okay, it needs to be grounded. Perfect. You know, put a, put a meter on it and it's, you know, zero ohms of resistance. This is great. You can't get any more grounded than that. And then we got a call once from an engineer saying, um, it, this machine didn't pass our ESD audit. I'm like, I can't understand why. You know, maybe you didn't ground the machine. He goes, no, we ground the machine. He goes, the problem is it's too good a ground. You know, there's, there's, there's no resistor. You need whatever K resistor, whatever it was. I don't remember. But uh, that was a hard lesson for us because we thought we were following the spirit of the, of the rule, you know. Um, right. But we didn't follow the letter of the rule. And, and that could have had we not remedied that. And it was an easy remedy. It was a, you know, 10 cent fix on every machine. Um, but that could have led to potential damage of customers' uh, parts, uh, you know, without right. knowing the full story. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's, those are, you know, most, most places, you know, I've dealt with and, and been in, you know, they, they understand, you know, the, the basic control items, you know, your, your workstation, you know, your wrist strap and, and ionizers and, and stuff like that. And where they struggled is from a knowledge standpoint was, you know, what materials to use elsewhere, you know, the, they had, you know, equipment where, they're using metal fixtures to hold hold their circuit cards that you know the card set down into and the whole back of it and all the test points and other stuff were touching metal and then that metal fixtures running across a <laughs> a conveyor belt that's that's kind of charging up and then boom it contacts a stopper in the machine that's going straight to ground and you know there's there are there's there's, there's so many things. It's uh, like I said earlier, it's a challenge. It's a puzzle. There's, there's so much to, to look at and, and fit together because as, as much as I sit there and say, Oh, well, you know, you want soft landing and stuff like that. There can be situations where you don't want that soft of a landing or, you know, just, but material selection is extremely important. Um, and you know, if you have good material selection, then, then, you know, that's half the battle um, with, you know, charge accumulation being the other. So let me ask, uh, going back to that subject of a, a stainless deck versus an ESD material, you know, laminate of some sort, um, are the materials, the, the non-metallic materials, is the discharge rate, the soft landing, as you say, built into the material itself, or is that still protected with a resistor? So it, depend, it depends on, on the material. On the material itself, um, some materials are, you know, naturally in the dissipative range, <clears throat> and but you know, even even with that, you still it may be in the dissipative range, but you don't want it to be floating. You know, you still need to, you know, attach it to to ground um, in in most cases, and so you know, it's a, a lot of it has to do with ex you know what you're doing in that process at that point. Um, on what is, you know, the best uh, route to follow for, for setting it up to protect your components. One interesting term, uh, which to me sends a message that your job will never go out of fashion. Uh, you have, you have a uh, uh, workplace guarantee, you know, forever, is I've never heard anyone say ESD prevention. I always hear ESD mitigation or ESD control. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, that mm -hmm. leads me to believe even if we control it to the point where it doesn't cause damage, it's still there. There will always be electrostatic discharge. The sole purpose of electricity is to find ground. It, it, it wants to get, you know, lightning shows us that. It wants to get to ground and, um, and it's going to find a way there. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the whole purpose of ESD control is to have a controlled landing, a safe landing, uh, one that doesn't cause damage. But there will always be ESD. We can't prevent that. Am I, is that an oversimplistic way to, to look at it, or is it accurate? 
I don't think it's an oversimplistic way to look at it. I mean, trying to, uh, you, you're not going to be able to, as much as we would love to, you're not going to be able to eliminate all charges off everything. I mean, you know, charge accumulation comes from contact and separation, right? And while some materials, you know, hold more charge through it than others, um, it's, it's, it's going to be there. I'm just, you're, when, you know, a person just, you know, walking, uh, you know, example that everyone knows. I mean, your, your clothes are rubbing up against your, your body and just the, you know, your, your feet touching the floor, then removing from the floor, that kind of stuff. You, you build up some kind of charge and it's, you know, different for everybody, different for each material. It depends on the combination of, of, you know, what materials are coming together and being separated and, and stuff. So, yeah, it, uh, that, it's a fantasy to, to be able to eliminate all charge. In my opinion, you, you can do your best to eliminate um, as much as possible. Uh, but, you know, that's, again, where material selection comes into play. It helps you re reduce the amount of charge that can accumulate in the areas where you would be most susceptible to damage. Right. Um, and those are the key places to limit, try and eliminate it from. Uh, and when you can't eliminate all of it, you, you know, you need to provide a soft landing or, or way to drain the charge out from, from whatever it is that's charging up before it can, you know, damage any of your sensitive components. Right. Let's get into the fun part. Let's talk about ESD fails. Um, I, I shared a, <laughs> a, a story or two, um, even at companies with an ESD program, um, there, there, I'm sure there are some common mistakes, some common denominator mistakes, and maybe even some very yeah. random mistakes that people make. What do you see in your line of work with all the experience you've had? Uh, what are the, the, the common mistakes and maybe even less common mistakes that you see people make time and time again? Uh, you know, a lot of it's really just the human element of it. Um, and that can come down to, you know, not fully understanding what, you know, uh, the potential cost to ESD damage. Uh, it seems like, you know, it's multiple times a year, uh, that, you know, somebody didn't strap up, whether as their heel straps, wrist strap or whatever, didn't follow, you know, one of the procedures, uh, to go with our ESD controls and handled product, right? And then you're having to go through and, and try and exonerate that product, trying to figure out, okay, did this person pos you know, what's what's the chance that they caused damage to, to what they handled? And, and that's part of where you want redundancy in your control items, right? You, you know, you're, you're the operator strapped up and they're working on a uh, grounded mat and have an ionizer on and, you know, they're, wearing smock and, you know, using tools and materials that are, you know, uh, you know, non-charging, whatever. And, and to where you can be like, okay, well, didn't have the wrist strap on. Okay. Well, this, this, and this helped mitigate. So our max potential of, of charge was, was, you know, X. And so because of that, we feel that, you know, there's, you know, very little risk, to what they were working on, do the sensitivity levels, that kind of stuff. So human error is probably the biggest one. Um, and, you know, as much as we try and eliminate that, uh, we all make mistakes. We all have our heads somewhere else at different times. And, and so it becomes common. And then the other, uh, the other things that I tend to see are when people, you know, they have a, a base understanding of ESD and, and, or, or other things. And it's like, well, we, uh, you know, if, if it's grounded, you know, things will, things will be fine. Or, or, you know, if one ionizer, you know, works well to, you know, remove charge off of something, well then two ionizers will work even better. More is better. That's not always the case. If you're, you know, you got the airflow crossing stuff like that, but you know, you and I had discussed this before on, on our uh, phone call a couple weeks ago. I did have one years ago, uh, 
we were one company I was working for, um, a plant in another country, got a call from them saying, Hey, you know, we are, we're seeing all kinds of issues on first shift, uh, where we're getting all kinds of fallout at, at ICT tester. And it's this, you know, same components, first one tested. And it's like, we're like 40% failure during, you know, first shift. It's like after lunch, it just goes away. And so we we're, they weren't letting me travel to review things like that at the time. And so it was like, okay, well, send me a flow chart of your process. Where does that component get placed? All the steps between it and to where you're finding it, ICT. And then I want you to take pictures and send it to me. And so I'm kind of going through the process and flow chart and I'm looking through the pictures and it's like right there at the ICT, it's like there, I see there's, storing assemblies they had cardboard boxes that were stacked up sideways and they were storing the assemblies there and i'm like oh, cardboard doesn't usually you know that doesn't charge up you know unless there's some kind of coating on the cardboard or whatever but it seems like a little bit of a fod issue so i get them on the phone and i'm talking to him about it. i'm like hey i noticed you're storing this stuff in cardboard i'm like there are some concerns about fod so which like then they're like for oh, the yeah, sake of my audience about. For the sake of my audience, FOD, foreign object debris, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they, I'm, they're like, yeah, well, we were, we thought about that. So, you know, we, the reason we're using those is we're waiting on the racks we ordered to come in. They were on back order, should be in, in like another week or two. They're like, but we thought about the FOD. So uh, to, you know, keep any shavings from the cardboard or whatever, we put down saran wrap. Huh. And I was like. Solve one problem. Okay. Yeah. So what was happening was they were, these assemblies were coming out SMT, you know, over three shifts and they were only run this ICT tester on first and second shift because it ran a little bit faster than, than, you know, the tack time in, in SMT. And so the stuff they were on third shift was getting put on these <laughs> saran wrap cardboard boxes and sitting on saran wrap, which, you know, holds a very high, uh, field of voltage and it was charging these boards up um, and the longer they sit there the more charge they would get and so the first ones they were testing in the morning um, you know they were killing a component and that's why the so they got after lunch and they were getting them straight from SMT and they were, they didn't have as much time on the uh, saran wrap <laughs> there, <laughs> there was something the funny there's something mysteriously funny about third shift our greatest um horror stories from a service perspective for our equipment mm. comes in the morning when we come into the office, we've got emails or voicemails from something that occurred at, at three o'clock in the morning. And it's always third shift that has the most interesting um, service cases. I don't know why yeah. I don't understand what it, it's like the witching hour or something, right? Yeah. All the gremlins are out. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've had your share of ESD audits, if that's the correct term. Um, right. What's your experience during an audit? Um, do you, what kind of things are you generally looking for when you do an audit? Walk me through a, a generic audit. Well, just a generic audit. You know, depending on what you're auditing, um, there's a couple different audits that I've done myself or personally do. Um, you have your your typical audits that are to your doc, documentation, right? Of you know what's your ESD uh, control program plan, right? So you know it states okay your ionizers, flooring, your workstations or whatever are going to be verified, you know every six months, right? And you know so you're making sure that that that's being done. You're making sure that hey. You know, uh, operators are supposed to be wearing a wrist strap when working, you know, when they're seated position. Right. So are they doing that? Um, you know, we have a list of materials that is allowed um, within proximity of the of the product. Right. You know, usually within you know 12 inches or whatever you, you control that. So you're looking for anything that isn't supposed to be there. Right. Um, you know, especially, you know, charge generators, your plastics, you know, th things like that. So, 
you know, those, those are the, those are things in a, you know, typical audit, you know, uh, uh, well, hey, you're checking in your heel straps, right? Let me see the record of, okay. of that to make sure that everyone's checking, right? And well, you know, you have the digital ones now that um, that you know record and, and stuff like that, and that's kind of made it easier. But then on the other side of it is I um, I've done for others, but I'll also do uh, in our factories is is you know really kind of a, a process assessment or a process audit. Right. And that's a little more in depth of, of taking a look at, you know, especially with automation, um, you know, taking taking a look at really is, you know, is the equipment that we're using to process our components. Uh, is that still meet our ESD requirements? You know, the, there's so many things that can that can happen over time as a machine runs. Right. You know, you you had good, you know, good contact, um, you know, to ground when you first got the machine in. But because of wear, now you don't have as good a contact because of PM. Maybe, you know, somebody was heavy handed with the grease gun in some areas. And now you don't have the, um, you know, kind of ground contact that you would, would need to try and mitigate things. And. And I've seen, you know, uh, it's actually a case study I, I presented at the ESG Symposium in 2018, where a, uh, a fixture nest basically was used um, in the stencil printing process. Uh, we, we use those nests to just basically pull a voltage off the, off the board during the paste process. Well, they used a different coating on that, a different type of allodyne that didn't um, didn't allow for it to, to ground out properly. So we weren't removing voltage from the boards. And so these bare boards, and then the first, you know, some of the first components that were, were placed, were getting, were, you know, getting lit up by about 3,500 volts and uh, some of them couldn't handle it. So just, you know, looking at material selection, what your process can handle is, you know, another audit. So, I'm sure there's been cases also where um, someone grabbed the wrong bottle of wax and applied nice shiny mm -hmm. wax to the ESD floor and basically mm -hmm. laid down an insulator. Uh, have you seen that happen? Um, I know of that happening. I haven't uh, seen it for a while. We did have a case where uh, one of the cleaning crew had come back from lunch and had their bag hanging on their cart um and was pushing through one of our areas and a ball of hot sauce fell out and uh busted on the ESD flooring um that was a third shift thing uh there you go there you go and, uh, so we had to kind of figure out um how to get that area to uh to be you know uh, meet our requirements again after you know getting the hot sauce cleaned up and and uh, yeah, getting that orange stain from that floor was. Um, <laughs> I guess it's good to know that the hot sauce. I love hot sauce on everything, and um, it's it's non-conductive hot sauce, I suppose. So, all right. Yeah, I'm not going to get shocked by it, but uh, it's not going to protect from an ESP standpoint. Yeah, it, it, it only it only changed the uh, the flooring, uh, you know, by one or two orders of magnitude. I think we went from <laughs> ten to the sixth, ten to the eighth in that area. Yeah, well, which that's was still you know measurable. fine, but yeah, yeah. So, do you have a? a I, I inter recently interviewed um, Tom Riccadelli, who who is a flooring, uh, ESD flooring provider, and yeah. you know, there's different types of floors. There's these interlocking floors that you can you know put down in pieces. Um, there's um, large sheets of laminate that can go down. That's uh, ESD safe uh, or safer, and then there's coatings that you can apply to an existing floor. Do you have a preference on which type of, you know, if you were building a factory where you, you were building products where people's lives depended on it, um, would you, and money was no object, would you, would you drift toward one uh, type of, of flooring technology over another from an ESD perspective? Um, I would actually call Tom because <laughs> he, uh, I mean, him and his company, they, they, 
they know their stuff. But I mean, there's, you know, here in Texas, in North Texas, we've got, you know, um, people don't realize it, but there's a, a lot of, of ground moisture. And that causes problems because it gets so dry during the summer, it draws that moisture up from, you know, uh, from lower in the ground. And that causes issues for different types of ESD flooring. Um, and then, so, you know, it, it, you know, it's all dependent on the environment it's going into and, you know, kind of where the factory is, where the kind of flooring that I would personally put in and, you know, somewhere in Minnesota would probably differ from here in Texas and definitely differ from somewhere in maybe Southeast Asia where you have a lot more humidity and stuff. And then of course, you know, depending upon, on what you're, what you're, you know, building. Um, but that's, you know, while I have my thoughts on, Oh, you know, I kind of prefer this flooring or maybe, maybe that flooring, um, you know, getting, getting the opinion of guys like Tom, um, is, is definitely the way to go because there's, you know, in fact, actually, um, for one of our areas, we're having to put down some flooring here recently. And, and I had a discussion with Tom about it and, um, said, well, you know, we have a habit of, well, we've put this flooring down in other areas. So facilities is just going to put that flooring down again because we, we have a bunch of it. And so, you know, I talked to Tom about it and he's like, oh, well, you know, have you thought of this or have you thought of this? Right. So it's always things you can, you can learn. And, and, um, yeah, so yeah, my first thing I, I, I'd call Tom, actually. call Tom. And for my audience who may have missed that episode, I don't recall what number that was, but I'll put a link to that episode. It was Tom Riccadelli. Uh, and, and he is an ESD flooring expert. He, unlike, uh, Christopher who has a wider, uh, expertise in all things ESD. Tom's specialty was flooring. And um, there are many ways for electricity to get into your product. One is through the floor. And, and um, I'll put a, a link to that, uh, to that replay if you're interested in getting more information on flooring best practices. Uh, the other thing I, it, you alluded to this, geography plays a role in ESD mitigation. Yep. Uh, generally speaking, is a moist, a more moisture-rich climate? Say, uh, does Malaysia have? Now, keep in mind, when you're inside a factory, theoretically, uh, heat and humidity are all controlled to a you know pretty universal level, but not in every case. I've been in many South Asian and, and Asian factories where I, I swear they don't have air conditioning. You know, it was, it was miserably hot and sticky. Um, is is a moisture environment generally better for ESD, worse for ESD? Is a drier environment, a uh, more arid environment, uh, better well, or worse? Gener generally, a, a more moist environment, let's say, in the you know 40 to 50% humidity um, range is, is going to be better on ESD controls for you just because as humidity gets lower, um, there's the opportunity for, you know, charge generation becomes greater with certain materials, um, especially, you know, your, your insulators and stuff. And that, that, that trend, you know, there's, there's the graphs and studies out there that trend goes down to, you know, about 12% is where that kind of flat lines. And, and as you go below 12% on humidity, it's, there's really no difference. And so that's why, um, you know, as 2020, you know, and, uh, you know, standards for, you know, if you're doing a material testing, that's, that's why they tell you to do, you know, the material testing at 50% humidity and then at, you know, 12 and a half percent to make sure it works, whatever material you're using for material handling or whatever you're using that for, that, that it works at those, those lower humidities, um, because there is a difference. Uh, doesn't mean that if you sit there and raise your humidity level to 75% in a, in a factory that, you know, all will be good and you won't have to strap up things like that. It just, uh, it, it does help with some of the charge accumulation. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, and, and you see there's, there's plenty of customers that, that have strict requirements on, Hey, if the humidity drops below 30%, you 
you're not working on our product. Right. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's some benefit to that. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's kind of a, an avenue I hadn't considered with that question. My question was more aimed toward, um, is ESD worse in a humid or, or dry environment? But in addition to that, and you answered that, and in addition to that, the ESD mitigation tools may work differently at a, mm-hmm. in a different climactic environment. Um, uh, floor sealants and, and, and other materials that are used to um, control ESD may have a different um, controlling benefit at higher or lower uh, humidity levels. That right. that makes perfect. That's sense. where material selection right. you know, comes into play again. You know, right. it's 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 so key to everything you do. Um, in there, you can you can have you can have great controls and stuff, but if you forget about your material selection part, you're you're you know fighting this fight with one arm tied behind your back. Sure, in my opinion. And if you do have higher humidity, you may, in general have less propensity for electrostatic damage. However, you will have a line of employees uh, leaving your factory <laughs> if you're making them work at 75 or 80% humidity levels. That would that would not be a pleasant Either that experience. or they take the ionizer and turn the heater on if it has the heater option, and then they blow it straight at themselves instead of on the product. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Try and, dry it other... out a little, try and dry it out a little bit. Yeah. Um, are there certain types of components that are just known to be poster children for... Uh, ESD damage uh, more than others? Are, are there certain components that are inherently more robust and other components that are just just uber sensitive to ESD? But, you know, typically your caps and resistors, right, or, you know, there's there's not as much to them there, right? But you're, you know... That would be more on the robust side? Yeah, more on the robust side, but, um, you know, you still... You know, it takes a little more voltage to do anything to those. And, uh, you know, though your, you know, your, your flip chips, your, your BGAs and stuff like that, depending on, you know, what, what that package is, is doing, you know, what it's, what, what the design purpose is, you know, what the size of it is, you know, is there a lot of, you know, is, is it a, power application or whatever. And then, so I think, you know, 20 years ago, it was a little bit easier to point to and go, okay, well, you know, it'd be, hey, BGAs, those are, you know, a little more susceptible than, than, you know, other things. But, but nowadays it's most every package um, as we continue towards miniaturization, right? Um, for the miniaturization, it is becoming more and more susceptible and uh you know it's where having a good relationship with your you know your those who make your components for you um you know to where hey listen guys we're getting this component from you what is the sensitivity you know did you guys actually do that testing on this component or is this based off of a similar component you've done testing on those or you know things you got to communicate with your suppliers about. Right. Uh, let's take this beyond components. When we're putting boards together, when we're assembling boards, of course, we're concerned about components. We're concerned about the board and the components on the board. That's the whole purpose of ESD uh, mitigation strategies is to protect those components from electrostatic discharge. However, for many people who aren't in our industry, who are simply using the products we build, um, there is also an ESD concern, and and um, a colleague, um, uh, Daniel Bogdanoff of Keysight. Keysight is the spinoff. For those who aren't aware, Keysight is the spinoff of Hewlett Packard. You know, Hewlett Packard made everything from printers to oscilloscopes, and they spun off the test instrument division and called it Keysight. Um, and they sell test instruments that are 100, 150 thousand or more dollars. They're they're not cheap. They're not you know, thousand dollar oscilloscopes. They're they're supercomputers in a box. And he produces a he's a fellow content creator uh, like myself and he produces content for Keysight. And one of the ones that caught my eye, and I'll play just a little twenty second clip from it, um, was entitled uh, Four Ways to Destroy Your Test Equipment. Here's what it looks like. 
You've probably heard the phrase, treat yourself, but if you want to blow up your equipment, it's time to float yourself. Throw caution to the wind. If your feet aren't buried in wet sand at the beach or your wrist isn't shackled to a properly grounded ESD mat, odds are you're high voltage, which is the perfect way to blow up your test gear. I can charge myself up just by walking around, and then we can watch this charge transfer into the board. If I'm grounded, it doesn't happen. Well, he's very entertaining. Um, I don't think I'm quite as entertaining as that, but uh, he's, he's got a good staff behind him. But uh, the point is, uh, as he was making, you could, you could ruin a, uh, or at least severely damage, a very expensive uh, priced piece of gear, um, in this case, test equipment, by not being properly grounded yourself. And, and the devices you're testing not being properly grounded. And uh, that's one way to, to um, you know, get a few thousand volts into something that's not designed to handle a few thousand volts. And that could be a very expensive proposition. Uh, in your experience, where you're um, watching over the ESD protocols of a company, uh, has your experience drifted outside of just the assembly process and also into the use uh, side of that business as well. Yeah, um, one of the one of the biggest uh, issues that uh, everyone really deals with is you know uh, cable discharge, right? And you're you know a lot of these units, is, especially in military and aerospace, you've got these box builds with you know um, multiple bayonet connectors that you know you've got to you got to plug into a harness or, you know, some kind of wiring uh, cable. And, you know, if the precautions aren't taken to ensure that, you know, the, the cable itself's not charged up or the box itself doesn't have some kind of charge, you can, you know, you can do a lot of damage. Um, and, you know, even if it's just a single component, the cost of, having to take every take that box apart get to that component to replace it you know sometimes you know there's boards attached to boards that are you know and attached with metal cores and stuff like that and it's not a it's just not a easy okay well i undid four screws took the lid off the box there's that component I took my soldering iron i removed it and put another one down and a little bit of solder a little bit of flux and hey we're good to go um you know, I wish it was, was wish it was that easy, in in all cases. But ninety nine percent of the time, it's not. Um, so yeah, and that we we run into that. Um, you know, at different times, uh, there's plenty of process assessments or reviews I've had to do over the years. Where um, on on the I'll call the back end side of the process, once you know they start putting together multiple. Uh, assemblies into one box build uh, where they felt they had, you know, some kind of issue. So it's, it's more common than I would like it to be. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. So compared to uh, when you first got into the ESD side of this business and today, hmm. um, have you seen any significant improvements in ESD mitigation technology? Are there, or is it the same basic um mitigation methodologies just applied maybe more stringently or, or you know, maybe better monitored? Are, are there new advances, newer advances that have been made over the years? Well, there's, a, there's been advances. And even though those advances are on, you know, our basic tenets of, of ESD control, right? You know, the ionizers 30 years ago, your balance, hey, listen, this ionizer stays balanced, you know, plus or minus 25, you know, that's, that's great. Right. You know, now you've got ionizers that, you know, are balanced, you know, plus or minus five, plus or minus two volts. Right. So, you know, much tighter window, which, you know, disk drive industry and all that stuff, you know, is very important to them. Um, you know, with the, the grounding, you mentioned about monitoring, you know, uh, when I first broke into the industry, there wasn't a lot of monitoring of your, your wrist straps. Now, most, many places have constant monitoring, but even, you know, 10, 15 years ago, some of the constant monitors you had, you could fool. I had instance where, 
walked up and there was an associate that was working on a, an assembly and their wrist strap was laying next to him on the workstation. It was still plugged in, but it, the, the cord was all bunched together and they had rubber banded around it. And the reasoning being was, well, it kept the constant monitor kept beeping at me when I had it on. And when I took it off, though, I kind of in frustration crumbled the cord and it stopped beeping. So, you know, it was, you know, it would, that was, uh, there were some constant monitors that you could, you could fool uh, in that way. And there were some that, you know, uh, didn't do well with if you were, uh, instead of connecting through a wrist strap, you were connecting to a smock. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's some that you, you know, the groundable garments. And, and there was some I tested that I'd plug in the groundable garment and I'd hang the garment on the back of a, just a regular chair and that constant monitor would never tell me that I, you know, it's, Hey, you're fine. Right. You know, I mean, we've, we've come a long way. I can't say that there isn't still some out there that, that maybe you can fool in some different ways. Um, but it has become a lot harder. It reminds me of, reminds yeah. me of putting black electrical tape over the warning lights in a car. You know, I was like, I don't see it. It's not there. Right. It's not beeping at yeah, me. It's not shining cool. a light on my face. So no problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Well, and typically though, the operators, uh, you know, in my experience have done a wonderful job of finding these creative ways to circumvent controls and right. it never s ceases to amaze me the the creativity that in the, you know, some of the steps they'll go through to, uh, to come up with some of the stuff. Once again, more job security. Uh, as we end <laughs> up my last question, tell me a little bit about Lone Star. You, you've, um, you've done the, most insane thing you're you, you started your own business uh, and i say that because i did that 30 years ago um it's uh it's it's a fun ride tell me about lone star and uh, what its purpose is what its services offered are and um and why you why you did that so um why i did it was uh after years of you know working uh, with esd with multiple companies and and being you know involved with the SD Association, uh, been asked uh, multiple occasions by people, hey, can you come take a look at this for me? You know, because you, what you're doing with the SD and stuff. And, and just, it just felt like the right time to go ahead and, and, and start a company to um, offer services such as, uh, you know, training, whether it's, hey, you need someone to come in and, and, and train people on whether that's just, you know, your, your, your basic ESD controls, um, you know, if it's writing the training to your, you know, control program or even writing a control program for you or setting up your control program, uh, we offer that uh, compliance verification. I can come in and do, you know, your verification of your control items, process assessments. Hey, you know, what can our process handle, you know, material evaluation, those kind of things. Uh, so basically trying to, you know, offer is as much help from an ESD standpoint um, that a lot of companies need. And I think it's more important now uh, than it's ever been because, you know, we've, we've continued to beat on miniaturization, you know, and, and the susceptibility of components and assemblies just, you know, continues to go um, push further and further towards zero. And while it's not affecting every electronics assembly or component it's affecting more and more each year and that's trend is just you know going to continue to to go towards zero and then with the chips act and the push to try and bring more electronics manufacturing and semiconductor business back into the u.s uh you know most places don't have true you know esd subject matter experts uh, right kind of like was thrown on me, you know, you seem to know a little bit about ESD so you can handle it, right? Well, maybe not everyone has the um, ability to go get the training necessary to get someone, uh, you know, in-depth knowledge of, of what what needs to be done to help protect their product. And and so, you know, with, with there not being, I want to say that there's a, a lack of knowledge because it seems like every year there's more and more people getting involved, but still there's a lot of companies that that have very little knowledge and they use help. And, and, you know, right down in other places I've worked, you know, we've, 
we've got subcontractors that do some of our work for us and stuff. And so it's important that, you know, these, these places, uh, you know, have, uh, have a resource for trying to, to help them get their ESG program to the, you know, best um, place they can be. And, uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's, uh, you know, as you as a business owner and, and, and from what you've seen is, is there's that, that whole, you know, cost analysis, right? You know, you know it's going to cost me this much to, to get somebody, you know, trained up you know, and, um, what's our, what's our risk, you know, what's that going to cost us and, and stuff. So, um, so, you know, based on a couple of things, I, I decided to, you know, finally start, you know, my own consulting business on the side and, uh, you know, offer my services to, to, you know, try and help any, um, anyone that needs it with, you know, whatever they need from, from an ESD standpoint. No, that's great. That's a wise move. Um, Unfortunately or unfortunately, a lot of ESD products, and I'm thinking mats and wrist straps and things like that, are commodities sold by, you know, large distribution companies that sell everything from, you know, quite literally kitchen sinks to plumbing fittings to ESD uh, control devices and, and, and soldering irons and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, they are probably good at the distribution model. They're probably good at uh, economy of scale, getting you certain things at good prices, but they mm-hmm. may or may not have subject matter experts in, in the topic of ESD on staff. They, they simply can send you a data sheet. And, and I think right. a lot of manufacturers, when we first started, we were on our own. We didn't know much about it. We knew ESD was a thing. We knew that we needed to have ESD mats and wrist wraps, and, but we really didn't understand the, the, anywhere near the complexity of ESD. And, and the people who sold us stuff simply took orders and they sold us whatever we asked to buy. And, uh, and, and they didn't really speak, you know, they didn't offer an education, but nor should they, that's not their job. So that's, um, that's um, a good business model to be able to provide um, your knowledge to, to customers. And speaking of that, um, for my audience who is listening, if you'd like to get in touch with Christopher, his contact information will be in the show notes. So if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Spotify or iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts, um, look at the show notes and on your app and you'll see uh, Christopher's contact information. If you're watching this on YouTube, right down here, there is a show more button. Uh, click that and you'll be able to see Christopher's contact information. And I'm sure you won't... Um, um, have any problem with people reaching out to you? Not at all. Um, I'm happy to just, you know, even answer, you know, simple questions. Um, you know, if, if, you know, people are just looking for a recommendation on something or, Hey, I've, we're seeing this is, you know, you know, do you, you know, what do you, what do you think, uh, about this? Should we, you know, implement, you know, more ionization, should we implement this or whatever in these kind of situations, you know, happy to try and provide some guidance where, uh, where needed. Well, that's amazing. Well, I appreciate that. I'm sure many in my audience will appreciate that as well. And Christopher, thank you so much for being my guest today on the Reliability Matters podcast. I really appreciate you being here and thanks for all your sharing all your knowledge. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on our newest channel, Amazon Music, or virtually wherever you get your podcasts. A special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm for syndicating this show. Thanks for your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. Send comments and episode suggestions to mike at mikeconrad.com. Just remember, that's Conrad with a K. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, click the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Well, once again, thanks for listening or watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, 
keep doing it right. And I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.